This is, this is, this is the Bottom Bends Podcast. Oh, yeah! Hello, and welcome back to the Bottom Bends Podcast. You are joined by myself, Richie, and of course, by my good friend, Oren. Oren, how are things? All good, man. All good. And yourself? All good. Yeah. Listen, folks, apologies for no episodes last week. Um, I was deadly sick, and Oren is teaching at the minute. Connor has a job, too. We're just, the schedules are not intertwining to make podcasts at the minute, but we thought we'd hop on and make a quick review here of Arsenal versus Manchester City. We're also going to have a bit of a review on Man United, because I feel like it's been ages from we talked about Man United. So going to crack off with Arsenal versus Manchester City. Oren, probably the most bland and boring game of football I have ever seen and that is not something I thought I would ever have to say about Manchester City or Arsenal but it really wasn't great was it? No both teams kind of set up very defensive by the looks of things it looked like very much both teams didn't want to lose Um, so obviously when that happens you know we've seen it quite a lot with United over the years and with different title contenders over the years whenever they have these big games they do tend to tend to set out a very defensive lineup and a very defensive style of play and look I can understand it from Manchester City's point of view going to the Emirates is tough for any team um, let alone going to the Emirates against probably again your direct rivals this year um, and of course missing Rodri as well who's been such a huge miss. We spoke about it a couple of weeks ago. I personally didn't think that it was going to have see such an impact on Manchester City, but it's proven me wrong completely. Their midfield looks, you know, a, a shadow of itself without without Rodri and Kevin De Bruyne. Um, so yeah, they were obviously compensating for that loss. You know, when you have the best player in the world in that position, all, uh, suspended for probably the most important fixture of the year, um, so far anyway. You know, you you have to set up defensive, really, um, and it's going to take a lucky goal. But the lucky goal actually came for Arsenal, and Martinelli got his got his due diligence um, after making it in time to be fit for the game. It didn't look like he was going to be fit at all. And Michael Arteta said that he was still a couple of weeks away yet, or he was scheduled to be a couple of weeks away yet, but he fought and um, trained hard to get back to fitness for the game. And, um, yeah, it paid off for Arsenal, and... A massive, massive three points at this stage of the city here, or at this stage of the season. Sorry, who are now sitting second only to their uh, fierce rivals, Tottenham. Well, look, it's the game itself was as you have said, Oren. I mean, it was defensive both sides. I mean, you couldn't fault the defenses really. I mean, both defenses were probably at the peak of their powers against one another, which is always good to see. I suppose you know that the defenders can hang in there and show their stuff and strut their stuff and. Um, especially Saliba. Man, I thought Saliba was absolutely unbelievable. Unbelievable. He locked Holland up for 90, mil- for 90 minutes. And I don't really think there's another centre-back in world football that can come out with a statement like that. But now William Saliba can. Um, Gabriel has made such an impact to this Arsenal team since coming in. And, you know, mentally and psychologically, I think this is going to be massive for Arsenal. Just for the simple fact that, you know, City was the team that they couldn't get over. It was the only team in the Premier League that um, Mikel Arteta had never beaten. And now he, he's kind of got over that hurdle. And I think this could be the start of Arsenal's, you know, real title push. Or in a lot of, you know, the media are, are saying that Arsenal last season maybe lacked control in games. Whereas this season, yeah, they've been a little bit less exciting. But the control is definitely there within games. Is that what you've seen from Arsenal yourself? Or do you think that entertaining, that flair style of football is still within this team? Um, I would say a bit of both, for sure. Um, You know, whenever we spoke about Arsenal last season um, and being title contenders, I very much stuck to my guns all season and and I didn't think they were going to win the title. Um, I thought that squad depth and inexperience was going to hinder them and that is exactly what happened. But now we're into a new season, they've got that experience of competing at the top level and competing for the league all season. They've got that experience under their belt. They've made important, huge signings um, with the likes of Declan Rice coming in and uh, even Kai Havertz. I know he's not been too great, but providing that squad depth and, you know, the squad, the Arsenal squad seem to love having Kai Havertz about and Arteta obviously rates him and the fans are enjoying him at the minute as well. And, like, you've seen that reaction when he scored the penalty. You know, the fans were were loving it for him. Um, 
And then even at the back, you know, for the first few games of the season, I thought it was the wrong decision anyway, and it's proved to be the wrong decision. He wasn't starting Gabriel. I don't understand what was going on there, but, you know, they had other players that were coming in. Um, so the squad depth seems to be there for Arsenal for sure. You know, even Thomas Partey's not starting every game. Um, the squad depth is definitely there. I looked at their bench the other day. They didn't have Saka in the squad at all. Their bench, they had Martinelli, um, they had Smith Rowe, you know, Partey, even Ramsdale, you know, the, the, their bench was stacked. And I was thinking, you know what? They were challenging for the title last year. I didn't think we were going to win it, but they've definitely, definitely got a, a better chance this year. And I think that inexperience, or that inexperience from last year is definitely out of them. Um, and I think they'll not want to go so far into the season and lose the hope of winning the title. Um, however, you know, they've definitely still got the quality, the, the flair, the fluorescent style of football. And they've got one of the youngest squads in the Premier League. So this is a team that's going to do it for years and years. Um, so Michael Arteta is really, really onto something here. Big time. Big time. Completely agreed. Um, look, I mean, from City's perspective then, Oren, now that we've sort of well and truly got Arsenal's perspective out of the way, like I personally thought City were quite naive in this game. And that's a statement that I've never made about Manchester City. But I, I thought the way they approached the game was wrong. Uh, you can tell no Rodri, no De Bruyne. It's not the same midfield. It's not a midfield weird in there as such. And look, that's not me saying that they don't have quality players. But look, the biggest talking point in the game, Warren, Kovacic, personally, I thought he should have seen red. What's your view? Exactly the same. I thought he was very, very lucky to stay on the pitch. And, you know, I really rate Kovacic. I think he's a really, really good player. I thought when he signed for City, he was going to be unreal. And, you know, he has done well when he's played. Um, and even like his performance all around, I know he had uh, two pretty bad tackles. His performance is still high quality, do you know what I mean? However, his coaching you should have seen red and took him off very quickly after. Um, so, you know, just once again, VAR controversy. Yeah, it's just becoming a common feature in the Premier League and becoming a common feature in this podcast where we have to analyze, uh, analyze these, these sorts of decisions. Oren, Haaland. Uh, interesting stats. His conversion rate has dropped to eighteen percent. Last season, it stood at twenty nine percent. Um, in all competitions, he's not been as clinical in front of goal this year. In fact, you know, us all being fantasy football players, I don't know, man. I'm really considering maybe taking him out of the team. And you know, I'm not saying that he won't end up scoring a, a major amount of goals, but at this current period in the season. Do you think it is maybe a bit worrying that he's not putting the ball in the net as frequently because an 11% drop is is a big drop in a conversion rate for a striker? Yes, I understand that. However, he still has more games than go, or more goals than games in the Premier League. Do you know what I mean? And it's It shows that it's a testament to the player and a testament to his qualities when we're talking about potentially taking him out, taking him out of our fantasy teams and you know it being a drop-off for him, even though he still has a better goes to game ratio, do you know what I mean? Um, it just shows how talented he is and the high expectations we do hold of him. Um, no, you, look, we, we've we seen it since Rodri's been suspended. That City team completely lacks control. And, you know, it's not Haaland's strong point to be playing with the ball. Haaland's strong point is putting the ball in the net. And if you're not getting the service, I understand his conversion rate is down. He still is getting... You know opportunities. However, you know this is the second season in the Premier League, and as we've seen yesterday with Saliba, Saliba bullied Holland out there, and it is not not necessarily that it's going to be a common theme. However, you know defenders are going to be able to better prepare for Erling Holland this season because they have that season under their belt and experience with him up against them. So there is going to be that extra bit of preparation put into trainings and stuff from Premier League clubs. Whether they've got the quality to beat him is completely different. But, um, you know, it it was always going to happen. You know, Erling Haaland was never going to score the same amount of goals. And not that he won't. It, like, he absolutely still could. However, nobody really knew what to expect from Erling Haaland when he came to the Premier League. Sure, we've seen that deck that supports Chelsea saying he wouldn't get 15 goals in the league. Idiot, boy. But apart from him, like, you know, we, we didn't know what to expect. We definitely didn't expect that. High, high goal tally, but um, 
no, I wouldn't be worried if it was Manchester City, and I definitely wouldn't be worried if I'm, if I'm Erling Haaland. Injuries have hindered that team completely. Yeah, Warren. I'm sort of torn on the Haaland thing just because. Oh, look, you know, I played striker myself, and I just feel like if your conversion rate is down, I would be worried because it it's what that tells me is you are still getting the same quality of chances. And actually, his projected XG is somewhere similar to what it was last season, which is also screaming to me that he is just missing bigger chances. And especially the West Ham game, man, the West Ham game will stick in my head this season. He had like four clear-cut chances to put the ball in the net and you're banking on him to put them to put them in the net and he just didn't. And it it, it does just worry me a wee bit. And by all means, <laughs> this is a world class player we're talking about. And by the time this episode goes out, he could have already made me look like a dick because he could have banged <laughs> four or five for Norway over this international break. But anyway, moving on from Holland. Oren, look, I know it's far too early to start making statements like, oh, Arsenal can finally go on, win the league. You know, we're only eight games into a Premier League season for, for crying out loud. Like, but what does this win do for Arsenal? In all seriousness, personally for myself, I think this is going to give them a lot of confidence. They finally got over the hump of beating the team that ultimately beat them out to the title last season. And I can really see a win like this propelling them on to the next level. And I could really, really see them putting a good run of fixtures together here. What about yourself? No, look, they've definitely got the capability within the squad now, as, as we just said. Um, you know, I think it's underestimated how big of a mental impact that that Community Shield win over Manchester City had going into the season. Um, so, yeah, look, Arsenal, we've seen it last year, and that was with the inexperience and lack of squad depth that I spoke about and went right to the very end. Um, so why not? Why not? go? Why, why couldn't they push for the title again? Um you know, as you said, eight games in the season. I think anybody making definitive statements about um, any position in the Premier League, whether it be who goes down, who wins the league, top five, top four, top six, whatever it is, I think anybody who makes any predictions, you're going to look a fool, an absolute fool, to be 100% honest. Like I said, Gary Neville said, Manchester United definitely won't get the top five. I fuck up, like, do you know what I mean? It's eight games in the season, wise up. Um, but anyway, um. Arsenal definitely have the quality. Definitely have the quality. Um, it's just going to be, you know, my, my only fear again for Arsenal. Yes, they're a young team and they have got that experience now. However, playing in the Champions League and the against the top quality sides in the world, it's different to playing in the Europa League. I know the Europa League would involve a lot more travel into like more rural countries and stuff. So that obviously impacts fatigue on players. However, Playing against a high quality opposition at high intensity all the time is going to be difficult for some of these players, especially with international breaks in between. And I think, to be honest, a big factor in Arsenal's potential title push will be the lack of a World Cup this year. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It, you know, we've seen injuries come from that World Cup, uh, which hindered Arsenal. Um, but yeah, absolutely, why not? Yeah, like they absolutely could go on a, on a run. But it starts now. You know, the Arsenal season, I know they've had a decent season uh, so far. They're sitting second in the league. However, excuse me, their mm-hmm. season genuinely starts now. Yeah. That win against Manchester City. They have to propel for that. There's absolutely no... If, if Arsenal go out and lose or draw their next game, what was the point? Do you know what I mean? Because three points is worth three points at the end of the day. Um whether it's against City or whether it's against Sheffield United. However, that mental block of beating City should propel them for the next three or four weeks, especially. If there's a slump in that, who knows what could happen. Yeah. And look, or an, an interesting topic in the Premier League this season is, of course, goalkeepers. And, you know, where there's been a few howlers in, in the Premier League this season, not least from our own goalkeeper, but we'll save that for another video. <laughs> um but David Raya versus Aaron Ramsdale, sparking a lot of debate online between Arsenal fans. For myself, I personally think that Raya is the better goalkeeper. However, that display of distribution yesterday was not of the highest quality, to be honest. It reminded me a lot of De Gea from last season, sort of just 
the completely wrong weight of pass, the wrong option, the wrong passing option, not looking comfortable on the ball at all. And like this was a goalkeeper that a lot of clubs who wish to play out from the back were were aiming to sign. You know that this is supposed to be a guy who's incredibly comfortable with the ball at his feet, and really he. He could have cost Arsenal a couple of goals yesterday, to be honest, if, if City had been a wee bit more ruthless up top. Um, what's your take on the goalkeeper situation? I mean, you've two really good number ones there who, in their own right, should be starting at Premier League clubs. So what way is this situation managed? Is this good for a team? Or is having two goalkeepers like this fighting for that number one spot, could it ultimately be Arsenal's downfall? Yeah, a bit of both. A bit of both, I uh, it's it's tough to throw an opinion on it. I think it's a very, it's a it's a good and bad headache for for Michael Arteta to have. Um, I think with the two goalkeepers that they are, I think it's going to have more of a negative impact than a positive impact. Um, look at the moment, you know, it's David Raya who's taking the number one spot. Um, and you know, Aaron Ramsdale, you can see him whenever Raya makes a stop. He's he's buzzing for him. They obviously have a good relationship at the minute. However. You know, displays like yesterday for David Ray, you know, Aaron Ramsdale's probably thinking, you know, I wouldn't have fucking done that there, so how am I not getting the game? And if David Ray is to go and start the next game, you know, what does Aaron Ramsdale think then? Um, and like we've seen, I didn't actually watch the documentary, but I've seen clips from that um, Arsenal documentary that was on Prime. You know, I think they won a game 3 1, and um, Aaron Ramsdale conceded a goal, and he was crying his eyes out because he conceded a goal and didn't keep his clean sheet. So it shows the winning mentality that that uh, Aaron Ramsdale has and the high expectations he has of himself. So I think, you know, with situations like yesterday where, as you said, on another day, Manchester City really could have capitalised on that and Arsenal would have um, been left red-faced and David Raya would have been left red-faced. If David Raya was to start the next game or is to start the next game, Fez Aaron Ramsdale, I'll be thinking, hang on a minute here. I'm Because I'm sure Michael Arteta has had an open conversation with both of them and said, you know, it's based on training because they are both quality goalkeepers. They both are of quality to start for Arsenal in the Premier League. Um, However, I think very much it will come down to um big personalities. And I would be shocked if in the summer one of them doesn't leave. And if one of them's to leave, it's Aaron Ramsdale. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it look it's it, it is a strange situation. It's it's one that I can't say I've ever really seen at, at a club where you've had two goalkeepers that are of a quality to realistically be be starting. No, normally Tom have it. Yeah, but um, I mean, well, Fabianski and Ariola, you know, at least Fabianski's at the tail end of his career. Yeah, he can and, understand. And that is probably where you see it most. Like Madrid had it with like Courtois and Casillas, I believe. But like Casillas was coming to the end of his career. Like he realistically wasn't good enough to be starting week in, week out anymore mm-hmm. for Real Madrid. And and that's when you see this kind of situation. So it is strange to have two keepers really at sort of their well, maybe not their primes, but coming coming into their primes. Yeah. You know, both both trying to fight out for a number one spot. It it, it is difficult. It is a difficult situation, no no, no doubt about it. Well, folks, that's going to cover it for Arsenal and Manchester City. Thank you very much for joining in uh, to our conversation and giving us a listen. Um, We are going to have an episode um, out on Wednesday as well. And that episode is going to be all about our club, Manchester United, and whether the dramatic late win against Brentford is enough to spark our season into gear. As always, you can follow us at Bottom Bins Pod on Twitter. Instagram and TikTok. Please head over there, guys. There's plenty of good content on there for you to, to shift your way through. And as always, keep a bottom bins. Keep a bottom bins. Mm-hmm.